So I've decided that what I'm going to do is basically give you access to um, my lecture notes. I'll probably even give you the LaTeX file at some point, just in case uh, you're interested in having access to those. Um, that'll be a little bit more complicated because there's several supporting files, but I'll try to get those to you if you're interested. Um, but as of right now, I will probably um, just give you the PDF of the notes that I typically have in front of me. Sometimes I don't follow them exactly, um, but that's okay. But you can kind of see right here uh, that I have this dwarves and jobs problem in front of me right now. This is what we were dealing with um, last lecture at the end. And um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to scroll through this presentation, basically, and, uh, and kind of talk through it with you. And as, as we have need, I'll actually go up to the, the board and we'll deal with that. Okay, so let's, let's try this out here. So just by way of review, we had these seven dwarves and seven jobs and um, there were various restrictions that I've indicated with X's and O's in this little matrix diagram that I've made for dwarves and jobs. And the goal was to um, assign jobs to dwarves, one job per dwarf, in such a way that no dwarf got a job that they were um, unqualified to hold. Okay, so um, that's what we see here. The X's mean unqualified. The O's mean qualified, okay? And you can also think of this as basically like a chessboard, uh, which is the way that we will eventually be thinking about it entirely. The X's will, will uh, mark as black squares or darkened squares, and the O's will just be squares that happen to be light colored, okay? So let's go through here. So remember, uh, the universe was just all bijections from the set of jobs to the set of dwarves, okay? And uh, uh, the thing is, we don't want all of the bijections. Remember, bijection is just a one-to-one -one correspondence between jobs and dwarves. We figured out that the number of uh, bijections is um, seven factorial in this case. Every time you assign a dwarf to a job, that basically eliminates one row and one column um, from the diagram up there, okay? We defined AI to be the bijections with forbidden job assigned to the i the dwarf. And uh, we thought about the fact that, okay, what we're really interested in doing is computing the number of things in the intersection of all the complements. We don't want to be in A1, we don't want to be in A2, uh, and we don't want to be in any of those sets all the way up to A7. And, and, and means it's intersection. So we just apply the formula for inclusion, exclusion. Uh, that, that's just going to be N, which is the book's notation for the size of the universe, minus S1 plus S2 minus S3 plus dot, 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 all the way down to minus S7. And what we did is we kind of went through and counted all of these various things. So uh, for instance, the size of the universe, as we have already mentioned, is seven factorial. We realized for S1, remember what S1 is. S1 is uh, just the sum of the sizes of all those sets, all those AIs. So what is the size of A1? Well, that means that dwarf one got a bad job, basically, okay? And there are two options for uh, dwarf one getting a bad job. And once we've chosen uh, one of those bad jobs for dwarf one in two ways, there are six factorial ways to assign the jobs to the other dwarves, okay? And similarly, that second sum and in S1 is obtained in, in a similar way, et cetera, et cetera. And what we realized was in the end, six factorial factors out. And you end up getting nine times six factorial. And we said, huh, 
Well, nine is just the number of X's in that diagram above, which makes sense because what we're basically doing is we're saying, well, uh, you know, someone has to have a bad job. So you pick one of those X's as kind of the bad, bad job assignment to a given dwarf, and then everybody else you just freely assign, okay? So that's, that's how we got S1. Now, and when we go to do S2, when we go to do S2, uh, the issue is we, we are intersecting two sets at a time. So for instance, with A1 and A2, that means that we have two dwarfs that get bad jobs simultaneously. They both get bad jobs simultaneously. And uh, we know, for instance, if you kind of scroll back up, you couldn't like have both dwarf one and dwarf two getting job one, right? Um, that would fail to be a bijection because job one would be, would go to two separate dwarfs, yes? Um, so there was, there were some restrictions there and the restriction turned out to be connected to uh, the way that a rook moves on a chessboard. A rook, if you place it in a square on a chessboard, it can move up and down in its respective column or left and right in its respective row, okay? So, uh, so for instance, if we assign job number one to dwarf number one, uh, which is this X value right here, then uh, that prevents dwarf two from getting job one, okay? So the assignments uh, that are uh, forbidden um, when we're just looking at dwarf one and dwarf two would be dwarf one job one and dwarf two job five or dwarf one job three, dwarf two job one or dwarf one job three uh, and uh, dwarf two job five, right? So that's where this little three comes from right here. Okay, so you have three options for simultaneous bad assignments for dwarf one and dwarf two. And then once you've done that, you just freely assign jobs to the other five, dwar five dwarfs in five factorial ways. Okay, so that's what this little parenthetical remark is right here where it says there are three bad ways uh, for both to get a bad job and then to assign the jobs uh, to the other five dwarfs, okay? So I made a big deal in class about the fact that uh, the size of A1 and A3 is zero because A3 is the empty set. There's no bad job assignment for dwarf three because they can take on any job. And, and I wrote down a couple more lines there uh, for your um, benefit. And what we noticed is that in the end, what we have is basically this huge sum. I mean, look at this disaster. Look at that right there. That's just giant. You know what I'm saying? Uh, three plus zero plus three plus four, but we can factor out five factorial. And we noticed that this 30 right here was basically just the number of ways to assign two jobs uh, assign two jobs to two dwarfs in a forbidden way, anywhere uh, among those forbidden squares, those X's, okay? So 30 is the total number of ways to do that, okay? Uh, I kind of put S3 is, is you know, if, if, if we hadn't noticed that, that would have been horrible. Uh, it turns out it's 46 times four factorial, it makes sense that you would have the factor of four factorial because S3, there we, we would be assigning three dwarfs jobs uh, on forbidden squares and then just freely assigning the other four dwarfs. And recall that then what we did is we had, uh, we had this as, as kind of the punchline of where we got. SK, it's pretty clear that it's the number of ways to choose K uh, X's on that thing above, or, or K darken squares, if you will, each in a different row and column. Um, that's basically a way to assign K dwarfs, K forbidden jobs. 
and then you just freely assign jobs to the other seven minus k dwarfs in seven minus k factorial ways. And, and we kind of reinterpreted that to be, uh, it's the same, right? The number of ways to assign k bad jobs to k dwarfs is the same as the number of ways to place k mutually non-capturing or non-attacking rooks on the board of forbidden darkened squares, okay? And then you just freely assign uh, jobs to the other seven minus k dwarfs and seven minus k factorial ways, okay? All right, so um, what I'm probably going to do is uh, I made this little example right here. Hopefully this makes sense. I'm probably gonna just talk through, uh, you know, look, it's one thing to deal with like S1 and S2, uh, maybe S3, but, but in general, it's gonna be quite difficult to, to figure out what's going on precisely, potentially, yeah? Um, so we need to think carefully about about how to do this, how to place rooks on these darkened squares. Down here in this picture, what I've done is I've taken the information up here. I've taken the information up here and I've basically put it into this down here. Okay. Um, so the darkened squares are uh, representing the, the jobs that dwarfs cannot have. Okay. The dwarfs are the column labels, the jobs or the row labels, okay? And to, to kind of try to make our task easier, what in the world is going on here? Well, I try to think about which squares have influence over other squares among the darkened ones, okay? And it's, it's pretty clear that, uh, you know, the square in row one, column one interacts with the square in row one, column two, for instance. And same thing with the square in column one, row three, and, but that one interacts with the square over in column four in row three. Do you see that? So one thing that we try to do, oh, and by the way, look at the, there's also a square in row five, column two, that interacts with the square at the top also. And you say to yourself, oh man, I'm seeing all these like interdependencies among these squares. So what I did in, right here at the bottom of this page is I actually shuffle these uh, rows and columns around. I first do the rows and then the columns. I shuffle the rows and columns around so that the interacting darkened squares kind of move over next to one another, okay? So for instance, let's just kind of talk through this. Look at, um, okay, so let's see here. What in the world did I do? Okay, so row two, what I did with row two because look at row two. Row two has a dark square in column five, but that's not interacting with like the stuff in row one or the stuff in row three. So I just I just went ahead and and I moved row two all the way to the bottom. Does that make sense? I just moved that thing down to the bottom. So you see that dark square kind of kind of moved down, all right, in column five, and. That's why you see the, the label two all the way down at the bottom and seven got bumped up by one, okay? And, and everything got, got bumped up by one because I moved row two down. Uh, row five, uh, I moved up to row two where, where row two was before. I moved row five up there so that that dark square that's in um, column two and row five goes all the way up to the second row now, and it's right next to the, uh, the boxes it was interacting with. Do you see that? Okay, and uh, then I also swap row four and, and row six. I swap those two um, just so stuff gets even closer. And that's how I arrive at that middle diagram right there, okay? And then look at column three and column six. I mean, those dwarfs, those, they have no restrictions at all. So all I do uh, in moving to the last diagram is I kind of, I moved the third column all the way to the end. And, and same thing with the, 
with the sixth column all the way to the end. And that, and then I get this nice diagram down here in the lower right uh, corner uh, of the notes here, where I have all of the darkened squares that are that are interacting, uh, in one sense, kind of up in the upper left part of the diagram. And then I have those two columns, three and six, over there on the right. Um, those are, you know, those are kind of off on their own. And then I have these other interacting squares in columns five and seven. Although you may notice that even row four is kind of its own thing. I mean, that's not really interacting with um, the dark squares in column five at all. But um, we just kind of shift those over there. And what that's going to do, it's going to significantly uh, reduce our, our overall task. Okay. Uh, I promise that that is what is going to happen. So that's just kind of a, a review of what we talked about um, with the Rook polynomial situation. And it sets us up for, okay, we need to count the number of ways to place rooks on these forbidden squares. Um, and the reason we're shuffling rows and columns around is, is to make that task a little bit easier. So in the next video, um, we're going to look at that a little bit more carefully. All right. But I think I am going to go ahead and I think I'm going to go ahead and sign off for now. All right. So it's been about 16 minutes. So I'm going to stop and we'll come back. And we'll talk about what we do with this new fangled diagram here. Okay, that is it.